Heidi by Johannes Beery. Chapter 5. Two Unexpected Visitors. A winter had passed, and then another happy summer, and Heidi's second winter on the mountain was nearly over. She began to look forward eagerly to the spring, when warm winds would melt the snow, and all the blue and yellow flowers would bloom again. Then she would go up to the pasture once more, and that she always enjoyed more than anything. She was now seven, and had learnt a great many useful things from her grandfather. She knew how to handle goats, and Daisy and Dusky ran over her like pet dogs, bleating with pleasure at the sound of her voice. Twice during the winter, Peter had brought up messages from the schoolmaster in Dorfley to say that Uncle Elm must send the child who was living with him to school. She was quite old enough, and ought in fact to have started the winter before. Both times, Uncle Elm replied that if the schoolmaster had anything to say to him, he could always be found at home. But he did not mean to send the child to school. These messages Peter delivered faithfully. When the March sun began to melt the snow on the slopes, the first snowdrops came out. The trees had shaken off their burden of snow and their branches were swaying freely in the wind. Heidi spent her time between the, between the hut, the goat stall and the fir trees and kept running to report to her grandfather how much bigger the patch of green grass had grown. One morning, just as she was dashing out of the hut for about the tenth time, she saw an old man standing on the threshold, dressed in black and looking very solemn. He saw she was startled and said in a friendly voice, You needn't be afraid of me. I'm fond of children. Come and shake hands. I'm sure you must be Heidi. Where's your grandfather? He's indoors, making wooden spoons, she told him, and showed him in. He was the old pastor from Dorfley, who had been a neighbour of Uncle Elm's when he lived there. Good morning, my friend, he said as he went up to him. Uncle Elm looked up in surprise and got to his feet. Good morning, Pastor, he replied. Then he pulled forward a chair, adding, If you don't mind a hard seat, take this one. I haven't seen you in a long time, said the Pastor. When he had sat down, Nor are you, was the reply. And now I've come to talk to you about something. I expect you can guess what. He paused and glanced at Heidi, who was standing by the door, looking at him with interest. Run and take some salt to the goats, Heidi, and stay there with them until I fetch you, said her grandfather, and she did not need to be told, told twice. That child should have gone to the school this winter, if not last, the pastor went on. The teacher sent you a warning, but you didn't take any notice. What do you intend to do with her neighbour? I don't intend to send her to school. The pastor stared at Uncle Alm, who was sitting with his arms folded and a very stubborn expression on his face. Then what will become of her? he asked. She'll grow up with the goats and the birds. They won't teach her any bad ideas and she'll be very happy. She's not a goat, nor a bird, but a little girl. She may not learn anything bad from such companions, but they won't teach her to read or write and it's high time she began. I've come to tell you this in all friendliness. So that you can think it over during the summer and make your plans accordingly. This is the last winter when the child can stay up here without any education. Next winter, she must come regularly to school. She'll do no such thing, said the old man obstinately. Do you really mean that nothing we can say will make you see reason about this? You've been about the world and must have seen and learnt a great deal. I should have credited you with more sense, neighbour. Would you indeed, said Uncle Alm dryly, but his voice showed that he was not quite easy in his mind. Do you think I'm going to send a little girl like Heidi down the mountain every day next winter, no matter how, how cold or stormy it may be, and have her come back at night when it's often blowing and snowing so hard it's difficult for a grown man to keep his feet? Perhaps you remember the queer spells her mother used to have. Such a strain might make this child develop something of the same sort. If anyone tries to force me to send her, I'm quite prepared to go to the law about it. Then we'll see what will happen. You're right so far, agreed the pastor amiably. It wouldn't be possible to send us to school from here. And you're fond of her, I can see. Won't you, for her sake, do what you should have done long ago? Come back to Dorfley to live. What sort of a life you lead up here at odds with man and God? There's not a soul to help you if you're in any trouble. I can't imagine even how you survive the cold in the winter. And I'm amazed the child can stand up to it at all. The child has young blood and a warm bed. And I'd have you know, Uncle Alm replied, and I can always find plenty of wood. 
My shed is full of it and the fire never goes out the whole winter through. I've no intention of coming back to Dorfley to live. The people there despise me and I them, so it's better for us to keep apart. It is not good for you, the pastor said. I know what you are missing. Believe me, people don't feel so unkindly towards you as you think. Make your peace with God, neighbour, and ask his forgiveness where you know you need it. Then come back to Dorfley and see how different people, people will receive you and how happy you can become again. He stood and held out his hand. I shall count on seeing you back among us next winter, old friend, he said. I should be very sorry if we had to put any pressure upon you. Give me your hand and promise you'll come down and live amongst us again and be reconciled to God and to your neighbours. Uncle Arm shook hands with him but said slowly, I know you mean well, but I can't do what you ask. That's final. I shan't send the child to school nor come back to the village to live. May God help you then, said the pastor, and he went sadly out of the hut and down the mountain. He left, he left Uncle Alan out of humour. After dinner, when Heidi said as usual, Now it's time to go see Granny's. He only replied, Not today, and didn't say another word that day. Next morning she asked again if they were going to see Granny's, and he only said gruffly, We'll see. But before the dinner dishes had been cleared away, they had another visitor. This time it was Detty. She was wearing a smart hat with a feather and a long dress which swept the ground as she walked and the floor of the hut was not particularly good for it. Uncle Alan looked her up and down in silence. However, Detty was all amiability and started to talk at once. Oh, how well the Heidi looks, she exclaimed. I hardly recognise her. You certainly looked after her all right. Of course, I always intended to come back for her because I know she must be in your way. But two years ago, I just didn't know what else to do with her. I've been on the lookout for a good home for her ever since, and that's why I'm here now. I've heard of a wonderful chance for her. I've been into it all thoroughly and everything's all right. It's a chance in a million. The family I work for have got some rich relations who live in one of the best houses in Frankfurt. They've a little girl who's paralysed on one side and very delicate. She has to be in a wheelchair all the time and has lessons by herself with a tutor. It's terribly dull for her and she longs for a little playmate. They've been talking about it in my place because, of course, my family, being relations, are very sorry for her and would like to help her. That's how I heard what they wanted. A simple, unspoiled child to come and stay with her. They said, someone a bit out of the ordinary. I thought of Heidi at once. And I went and saw the lady who keeps the house for them. I told her all about Heidi and she said she thought she would do. Isn't that wonderful? Isn't Heidi a lucky girl? And if they like her and anything were to happen to their daughter, which is quite likely, you know, it, it, it might well be that. Have you nearly finished? Uncle Alm interrupted her, having listened so far in silence. Detty tossed her head in, ex in exasperation. Anyone would think I've been telling you something quite unimportant, she said. There's no one else in the whole district who wouldn't be thankful to hear such a piece of news. Tell them, then, he said dryly. It doesn't interest me. Detty flew up like a rocket at these words. If that's what you think, then let me tell you something more. The child will soon be eight and she doesn't know a thing and, won't, and you won't let her learn. Oh, yes, they told me in Dorfley about you not sending her to school or church. But she's my sister's child and I'm still responsible for her welfare. And when the chance of such good fortune has come her way, only a person who doesn't care what happens to anyone could want her to keep her from it. But I shan't let you, I warn you, and everyone in Dorfley's on my side. Also, I advise you to think twice before taking the matter to court. You might find things being remembered which you'd rather forget. There's no knowing what may come out in delight in the court of law. That's enough, thundered the old man with his eyes ablaze. Take her then and spoil her, but don't ever bring her back to me. I don't want to see her with a feather in her hat or hear her talk as you have done today. And he strode out of the hut. You've made grandfather angry, said Heidi, giving her aunt a far from friendly look. Oh, he'll get over it, said Detty. Go on now, where are your clothes? I'm not coming, said Heidi. Don't talk nonsense, snapped her aunt, but continued in a coaxing tone. You don't know what a good time you're going to have. She went to the cupboard and took out Heidi's things and made them into a bundle. Put your hat on. It's pretty shabby, but it'll have to do. Hurry now, we must be off. I'm not coming, Heidi repeated. Oh, don't be stupid and obstinate like one of those old goats, snapped Detty again. I suppose it's from then we've learned such behaviour. 
You just try to understand now. You saw how angry your grandfather was. You heard him say he didn't want to see us again. He wants you to go with me. So you'd better obey if you don't want to make him angrier still. Besides, you can't think how nice it is in Frankfurt and how much there is going on there. And if you don't like it, you can always come back here. Grandfather will be in a better mood by then. Could I come straight back again this evening? Asked Heidi. Well, no. We'll only get as far as Meinfeld today. Tomorrow we'll go on by train. You can always go back the same way if you want to come home. It doesn't take long. Detty caught hold of Heidi with one hand and tucked the bundle of clothes onto the other arm. And so they set off down the mountain. It was still too early in the year for Peter to be taking the ghost up the pasture. So he was at school in Dorfley, or should have been. But every now and then he played truant. But he thought school was a great waste of time and could see no point in trying to learn to read. He liked much better to wander off and gather wood, which was always needed. On this particular day, he was just coming home with an enormous bundle of hazel twigs when he saw Heidi and Detty. Where are you going? He asked as they came up to him. I'm going to Frankfurt on a visit with Auntie, said Heidi. But I'll come in and see Granny first. She'll be expecting me. No, you won't. There's no time for that, said Detty firmly as Heidi tried to pull her hand away. You can go and see her when you get home back. And she kept tight hold of her and hurried on. She was afraid Heidi would change her mind again if she went in there, and the old woman would certainly take her side. Peter rushed into the cottage and flung his sticks on the table as hard as he could. He just had to relieve his feelings somehow. Granny jumped up in alarm and cried, Whatever's that noise? His mother, who had been almost knocked out of her chair, said in her usual patient voice, What's the matter, Peterkin? Why are you so wild? She's taking Heidi away, he shouted. Who is? Where are they going? asked Granny anxiously, though she could guess the answer, for her daughter had seen Detty pass on her way up to the Uncle Elms and had told her all about it. Now she opened the window and called beseechingly, Don't take the child away from us, Detty! But they hurried on, and though they heard her voice, they couldn't make out the words, but Detty guessed what they were and pulled Heidi along as fast as she could go. That was Granny calling. I want to go and see her, said Heidi, trying again to free her hand. Can't stop for that, we're late as it is, retorted Detty. We don't want to miss the train. Just you think of the wonderful time you'll have in Frankfurt. And when you come back, if indeed you ever want to, once you're there, you can bring a present for Granny. Can I really? Heidi asked, pleased with this idea. What could I get for her? Something nice to eat, perhaps. I expect she'd like the soft white rolls they have in town. She must find black bread almost too hard to eat now. Yes, she does. I've seen her give a piece to Peter before because she couldn't bite it. Oh, let's hurry, Detty. Can we get to Frankfurt today? Then I could come back at once with the rolls. She started to run so fast that Detty, hampered by the bundle of clothes under her arm, found it hard to keep up with her. But she was glad to get along so quickly because they were coming to Dorfley, where she knew people would start asking questions in a way which might upset the child again. Sure enough, as they went through the village, remarks came from all sides. Is she running away from Uncle Alm? Fancy she's still alive. She looks well enough. To all the questions, Detty replied, I can't stop to talk. You can see we're in a great hurry and we've got a long way to go. She was thankful when they had left the village behind. Heidi didn't say another word, but ran on as quickly as she could. From that day, Uncle Alm grew more silent and forbidding than ever. On the rare occasions when he passed through Dorfley with his basket of cheeses on his back and a heavy stick in his hand, mothers kept their children well out of his way, for he looked so wild. He never spoke to anyone, but went on down to the valley, where he sold his wares and bought bread and meat for the proceeds. People used to gather in little groups after he'd passed, gossiping about his strange looks and behaviour. They all agreed it was a mercy that the child had escaped from him and reminded one another how fast she had been running down the mountain, as if she'd been afraid he was coming back, coming after to fetch her back. But Peter's granny always stood up for him. Whenever anyone came to bring her wool to spin or to fetch the finished work, she took care to mention how well he had looked after the child, and how kind he had been about repairing their cottage, which might otherwise have fallen down by this time. The villagers found this hard to believe, and decided that the old woman did not know what she was talking about, being blind and probably rather deaf as well. Uncle Al never went near her cottage again, for he had done his work well, and it was now strong enough to stand up to the stormy weather. Without Heidi's visits, Granny found the days long and empty, and she grew very sad, and often used to say, I should like to hear that dear child's voice again before I die.